Hello everybody, welcome back to another Strength Materials video. This one's going to be super easy. It's on column buckling. We have three points that we're going to cover quickly before hopping into this problem so that we can understand the theory and where everything's coming from to solve it. And a good place to start, obviously, is talking about what a column is. And intuitively, I think we all know exactly what a column is. It's a straight prismatic member that is mainly axially loaded. In some cases, you can have moments and lateral loads applied at these supports, but for now, let's just talk about the axle load case where it's uh, solely axle load. Now, in previous videos where we had members, right? We had members in the horizontal direction, which are loaded kind of similar to this. We would talk about the failure mode of yielding. And what yielding means is that the stress developed in the member is going to exceed the yield strength of that material. Now for columns, we have to consider something a little bit different, which is failure by buckling. Now, buckling is simply when a lateral displacement occurs between a certain length on this member. And if that lateral deflection is greater than the limits prescribed for that member, then we are going to create an instability. Now this instability is going to result in stresses that are developed as you deflect from that stable position, which will ultimately fail the member as well. So it's not technically a material failure, however, an instability failure. Now, in order to analyze uh, these columns, we need to understand that this buckling needs to be limited. So we cannot have a lateral deflection that is greater than allowable limits. And in order to do this, we have to understand two things. First is effective length and how it works at predicting the shape of buckling and where buckling will occur. So let's relate this back to what we talked about in previous videos, which is a simple beam analysis, right? So we have a pin-pin condition here. Let's imagine this was horizontal for a second. We have pin-pin, and we're allowed to rotate about these two points at the supports. In the fix-fix case, we have a restriction from the support condition, meaning that we are not free to rotate about these points. What did that mean for us? That meant that our deflected shape was going to be governed by these support conditions, and we would have inflection points for the fix fix case where you would be uh, bowing in one direction between those points and then the opposite in the other because of that restricted rota rotation. Now, relating this to a column, everything between these inflection points is going to be your effective length, right? So that effective length pretty much means where buckling is most likely to occur. And we can solve for what this length actually is, but the easiest thing for us to do, which is uh, already derived, is apply a factor based on our support conditions. So for pin pin, the effective length will actually equal to the length of your member. But for fixed fix cases, you apply a factor of K to your uh, original length, and that will give you your effective length. Now taking this concept, we plug this effective length into Euler's formula for critical loading, and this will prescribe a load that cannot be exceeded based on the length or the effective length of your member. And this is also related to the flexural rigidity of the member as well. So E, Young's modulus, and I being the moment of inertia. Now, the derivation for this equation is a bit tricky, but pretty much all Euler did was relate the internal moment that was developed inside of the column to the deflected shape that was predicted for it, okay? Now, if we want to, we can also represent this formula in terms of stress. So if we wanted to restrict the stress that develops in a member, we can do that by simply plugging in the inertia in terms of a r squared. And what r is, is your radius of gyration which can also be solved for like this, which is the root of the inertia of your member over the area of your member. Now I've explained what radius of the gyration was in a previous video, if you wanna go back and see a visual for that, but all this pretty much means is that uh, the distance from a respective axis, so if you had like your member like this, let's say, and the center is right here, if you took a distance away from that, and concentrated the mass of your member at that distance away, it would give you an equivalent moment of inertia based on this radius of gyration for this concentrated mass. So this length would be R, all right? So 
now that that's covered, we can understand that uh, I will equal to AR squared. Rearrange in this formula, you are left with a stress, the A comes over, things get simplified, and you're left with this formula right here. And on the bottom, you have the effective length over the radius of gyration. And all that is, is a relationship that can predict what type of column you have and how, f uh, how flexible your column is pretty much. But we'll explain that in uh, later videos. But for now, these are the equations that we're going to be working with and the factors that we're going to be working with. Okay. Alrighty, let's hop into this problem and see what we're dealing with. We have a steel bar AB, which is connected uh, to member BC here, and it has a rectangular cross section. Uh, if it is a pin connected, a member at its ends, so at A and B, wants to determine the max allowable intensity of this distributed load W on B and BC, such that uh, the applied load will not allow buckling in member AB. And it wants us to use a factor of safety with respect to buckling of 1.5, and it gives us the steel properties, uh, elasticity, and the yield strength. Now, the main takeaways here are that, first of all, we are going to be thinking a little bit of how to get a critical axle load at the top of this column by breaking down the forces inside of this beam. The second important concept is going to be this factor of safety, which we need to apply to that axle load in order to ensure that our structure is safe. This is a very common uh, practice in engineering where you have a load that you calculate and then you apply factors of safety to account for unpredictable conditions based on the type of loading. So if you had live load, dead load, uh, seismic loads, like any type of load that um, is applied to your member has to be accounted for based on a factor of safety or a load factor. But for our case, let's just talk about this 1.5 factor of safety in the problem. Now we can start by looking at this FR, which I've already drawn, and we can figure out what that FR is simply by taking the length of that member times the intensity, which is W. And if we think about the reactions of this pin-pin member, we're simply going to have one half of this at each end. So BY in our case, which is the axial load acting at the column, is going to be 5W over 2, which will give us 2.5W. Now, if we think about the factor of safety now, we can simply apply this to the reaction at the top in order to account for that factor. Okay. So if we took this now as a PCR, we can simply equal it to BY times FS, which is our factor of safety. And that's going to be 2.5W times 1.5, leaving us with 3.75W. Now, what do we need to do? Now we need to think about what our values are in this equation. So what is LE? LE is simply going to be equal to L. Why is that? Because this is a pin-pin member. And we remember that the factor will be one when we have a pin-pin support. So this is simply going to equal three meters. Now talking about inertia, we have I, but are we using IXX or IYY? We are going to be using IYY. And let me explain why. <laughs> a lot of whys. Um, this is because the lowest moment of inertia value is going to govern which direction your member will buckle in. So we know that the uh, formula for inertia looks something like this. We have 1 over 12 base height cubed. And this is for all rectangular shapes, right? So we know that the greater the h value is in our case, the higher this inertia value is going to be. So our critical buckling will occur with respect to this direction, kind of parallel to the xx axis, because the height here is the shortest based on the 30 mil length that was given uh, on the other side, right? So we have the 20 mil, which is going to govern the height, meaning that we need to consider inertia about this yy axis, okay? So we can start plugging in for iyy. And this is going to equal 1 over 12. And then the base is 30, so 0 0.03 in meters. And then the height is going to be 20, so 0 0.02 meters. And this is to the power of 3. And solving that, we're left with 20 times 10 to the power of negative 9 meters to the 4. 
Now we can start plugging into our equation here. We have everything solved for. We have 3.75w, which is going to be equal to pi squared. And then the uh, modulus of elasticity, which is 200, and that's in GPA. So converting that to Pascal's, we have to do 10 to the 9. So that's going to give us Newton meters squared. And then we have the inertia value, which was solved for. We have 20 times 10 to the negative 9. And that is in meters to the 4. And then all of this is going to be over our effective length squared. And we already know what that value is. That is 3 meters, and that's squared. Solving for this, you have a distributed load intensity of 1,170 newtons per meter, which is equal to 1.17 kilonewtons per meter, which is a more common unit. Now, plugging this back into our formula for what PCR is, we have PCR is equal to 3.75 times W, so 1.17 kilonewtons per meter. And this is actually a meter value, by the way. Canceling those meters out, we are left with a value of 4.39 kilonewtons. And if we do a check right now to see if we exceed our yield stress in our member, we can simply look at the critical stress equals to PCR over the area of the member. And we have these numbers solved for already. We have 4.39, that's 10 to the 3. That's newtons on top. Then on the bottom, we have the area of our member, simply 0 0.02 times 0 0.03. That's meters squared. Solving for that, you have 7.31 MPA, which is obviously much less than the yield stress of our member, or the yield strength, sorry. If this video helped you, feel free to leave a like and ask any questions in the comments below. If you want more videos like this, feel free to click the links on the screen.